know, the Bible says there's a stream thereof. There's a river. The streams thereof make glad the city of God. Amen? How many know the joy of the Lord is our strength? The Bible says that a merry heart does good like medicine. So let's stop and think about that. That means if you're happy in your heart, it can work just like medicine. In other words, it can have an effect on your physical body. How many people believe that? <laughs> All right, we're going to have to get a little more fired up in here. We need, to let, we need to let heaven hear that we're serious. Amen? I always like to define what, what it is we're doing here. Why are we, why are we coming together as, as a body? What is it that God wants to do? Well, how many know that the Bible says that we, you as the saints, are to do the work of the ministry? Amen? The Bible says that the fivefold ministry gifts, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher are the, for the equipping or the perfecting of the saints to do the work of the ministry. It is not their job to do the work of the ministry. It is, it is the job of the saints to do the work of the ministry. Amen? Y'all with me so far? But it does not say that the prophet, the apostle, the evangelist, the pastor, and teacher are the ones that equip the saints it is the gift that God has given that equips the saints. Amen? But we have to be able to receive from the ministry gift itself, which means that we don't receive from people. We receive from the gift. Amen? We receive from the ministry gift that is given. So in other words, when you're here, when you're in this room today, you need to hear the voice of your shepherd speaking to you today. You don't need to hear my voice. You need to be, be able to tap in to the Spirit of God. Amen? And be able to receive something. It's a supernatural thing. How many know the Bible, the, super, the, the Bible is a supernatural book from cover to cover? Religion has taken all that out of it and made it routine and everything else. But it's a supernatural book. You read the things that happened in the Scripture. There were just crazy things that happen in the Scripture. It's a supernatural thing. And when we come into the church, we need to be able to receive from that. Amen? Y'all with me today? Can y'all do that? Do you want to receive from the Spirit of God today? You want to receive something. You need it. We all need it. Amen? So let's just pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this time together. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that your Spirit, Lord, is going to touch us and do things within our hearts today. Lord, you're going to minister to us. You're going to build us up. Lord, we're going to leave this place different than when we came in, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. How many know that everything you do in life is a product of what you believe? We had the privilege of going to take our oldest daughter to England and Scotland, and everybody said, everybody we talked to said, bring an umbrella, bring raincoats. Well, if we believed them, which we did, guess what we did? We brought umbrella and brought raincoats. So if you read the weather forecast and you think it's going to rain, what are you going to do? You're going to bring an umbrella. Amen? Everything we do, and by the way, it didn't rain a drop over there. We had beautiful weather, even though everybody said it's going to be terrible. And the tour guides, were they just couldn't believe it, that the weather was so great. And I just believe it was just the favor of God just blessing us. We had just a great time over there. But everything we do is a product of what we believe. Amen? We had a crisis at our house the other day. I've got six kids. I've got five beautiful girls, a little boy that is just, it's just, just, I'm just, it's just an embarrassment of riches. Okay, I'll just go ahead and say it. God has blessed us so much. But I came home and there was a crisis. We live on a, a wooded lot. My wife loves trees. So, you know, we cut just barely enough trees down to, to, to build a house. So it's all natural, you know, woods and everything. We have this big window on the back. And so I come in and pickle the baby. We call her Pickles, the story behind that. But she's just bawling her eyes out. And the other girls, they're all teared up and everything. And I'm like, what, what in the world is going on? Well, a bird had flown into the window, smashed into the window, okay? But it didn't die right away. It laid there on the pavement and was gasping for breath. And they watched this bird die, and they were like destroyed watching this. They just crushed them. 
We had to have a funeral for the bird and everything else. But everything's a product of what we believe. If we believe, how many know death is a terrible thing? And Katie, I appreciate what you shared this morning because it's right on with what I believe God is speaking to us. Death is a terrible thing. Well, if you believe the wages of sin are death, you will avoid death. Amen? You will avoid sin if you really believe that. Everything we do is a product of what we believe. The real problem with the church today, you know, the church should be the most powerful force on the face of this earth. And it just doesn't feel that way, does it? It feels like we're getting whipped on every turn. We're getting whipped here and whipped here, crushed here, spanked here. Why is that? Well, I believe the main reason is because there's a whole lot of talking. You can go out on YouTube. You can find any flavor of Christianity that you want. You can find whatever you want out there. There's a whole lot of talking, but there's not a whole lot of walking. And I'm talking about the basics. I'm talking about the basics. I'm talking about men, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Amen. I mean, I tell people, if you, anybody who will listen, bless your wife, bless your kids, everything else just kind of takes care of itself because she is the most important thing that you've got. When God gave the parallel of the relationship between the church and Jesus Christ, he used the most powerful example that he could, and it was a bride and a husband. And the enemy has tried to diminish that, tear it down, separate men and women, all these kinds of things to try to destroy it because he doesn't want us to understand the relationship that we have. But you know, it doesn't matter what he does or what he says. Research shows clearly that spousal bereavement is the worst kind of loss you can experience with death. Even more than a child. Imagine that. Why? Because God said the two will become one flesh. Amen. How many men are married in here? Oh, y'all are looking kind of ashamed. Get your hand on up there. Is your wife here? If your wife is here, grab her by the hands. Come on, do it. Look her in the eye and say, you're the most important thing I've got. Without you, there's nothing else. Amen. Amen. That is the relationship we need to have because that is the relationship Jesus has with us. I'm pretty sure I'm going to go out on a limb and just say it, but I'm pretty sure if I got an Advil, an Advil, 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 thinking about Advil, <laughs> an Advil and a sledgehammer and got the toughest man in here, probably Tyler, the most jack guy in the church, put his finger right there, and if I slammed it with that sledgehammer, I'm pretty sure that nothing else is going to matter until his hand quits hurting. That is what the Bible says our relationship with our wife is like. It doesn't matter when she's hurting, nothing else. The time stands still till she's okay. And that is the relationship that Jesus Christ fostered with his church. And we should model that. Man, you're the high priest. I don't know why I'm talking about this this morning, but you're the high priest of your home. You are responsible. I know that I know that one day I will stand before God and I will give account for my family. He will look at my wife. He will look at my kids and he will say, what did you do? And this is another sermon altogether, but go to the book of Revelation. I believe it's in chapter 20. Because I want to dispel a myth because, you know, we, 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 we have all these controversies in the church, you know, once saved, always saved. Can you use the sh lose your salvation? Whatever. I don't care about all that. But the Bible says clearly in Revelation, it says in the great white throne judgment that the books were open. Which you can turn to it if you'd like. It's in Revelation 20. I can't remember what verse it is. But it says the books were open. Am I reading that right? Does it say books? Is it Plural. And then it says, and then another book was opened. Is that what it says? Which is the book of life? And each one was judged according to their deeds, what was written in the books. 
doesn't mean that you're going to go to hell because you judge by your deeds because it follows up and it says, when your name is written, anyone whose name not written in the Lamb's book of life was thrown into the fire. But we are judged according to our deeds. What we do does matter. It's not just, it's not just frivolous. Amen? Jesus, the disciples asked Jesus this question. And I guess it wasn't a question. It was more of a request. They said, Lord, increase our faith. How many have ever felt that way? I just need more faith. God, give me more faith. And interesting enough, Jesus, being Jesus, <laughs> some of his responses, you know, you're just like, what is he even talking about? He didn't answer the question. He said, if, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and it will obey you. Faith is a supernatural thing. I don't know if you figured that out or not yet, but you can't manufacture faith. You can't think it up. You can't dream it up. You can't drum it up. You can walk around and confess. And you know, the, 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 and I believe in saying the right things, but you know, my dad always used to say, blab it and grab it, name it and claim it. You know, whatever you want to call it, all that stuff is important and you need to do it, but you can blab it and grab it all you want and it won't change anything in here. Faith is a connection. Faith is when you connect with God, the Spirit of God. It's the Word of God connecting with the Spirit of God, and all of a sudden it produces faith within you. It's a supernatural thing. You can't make it up, but when it's there, you know it. And I love the way Terry says it. He says, you know when you're knower. And I'll tell you this story again. I've told it over and over again. You're probably tired of hearing it, but I'm going to tell you anyway because it was one of the most unique moments in my life. We have six kids we took, it took a long time for us to get pregnant with the first, and we lost the first baby. And I really wasn't prepared for the effect that it really had on me. And so we were going to have, you know, keep trying. So I had so much fear after that that Erica got pregnant, and I just had so much fear. I was struggling with it. You know what I'm talking about? You wake up in the morning and you just have it instantly. You wake up. As soon as you wake up, you got that knot in your stomach. And you're worried and you have this anxiety. Like, oh, no, oh, no. And, just, and so I would work during the day and I would get my mind off of it and I would be fine. And then at night, it was just all, it was just like a, it was just like a weight. It would just descend on me and I couldn't shake it off. And I was in a hotel in Birmingham, Alabama for a, a business trip. And I had back when we actually had our Bible, you know, like a written Bible. You ever seen one? You know, it has pages and stuff. And I had a little pocket New Testament. And I pulled it out, and I was just so stressed out. And I started reading. I turned to the first chapter of John, and I was reading the first few verses. And when I got to that scripture where it said, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness was not able to overcome it. I can't tell you what happened, but instantly all the stress drained out of me and I knew that I knew it was going to be okay. And I can't explain it, but I never had that feeling again. God, because of the combination of the Spirit of God and the Word of God, brought it to life and faith came. This is the kind of faith that we have to have. This is the way we advance the kingdom of God. This is the way you advance in your walk with God. It's the word and the spirit. Many times we're praying and we say, hey, we need this, we need that. No, you need a word from God. You need a word from God because once you have a word, the faith is gonna come and you're gonna know that you know. Many years ago, we had a friend who, a uh, family friend we had known forever. Out of the blue, he gets a diagnosis of cancer and it's the kind of cancer he wasn't gonna survive from. Back in a few months, he would be dead. And I remember it just hit us so hard, and we just, and we just, just, we just didn't know what to do. And I remember praying and praying. I'm like, God, I need to, I don't have the faith to pray. I can't, I want to pray for him, but I just don't have the, I don't feel it. <laughs> I just feel like I'm praying frivolously. I need to know. And in that time, God spoke to me through a scripture, 
And I can't remember which scripture it was, but it was one of those that, you know, he will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. And I just knew, I just knew. And I went to my mom and I said, hey, it's going to be okay. I know it. I know it. This is not God's will for him. He is going to survive. He is going to recover. Goes back to the doctor. They can't find anything. This has been 30 something years ago and he's still alive and well. You just need a word from God. The word and the spirit. See, the word by itself is just dry. That's why a lot of religion is just dead works because there's no spirit. Uh, the, the, The word is not, the word, you know, there was a song, B I B L E, the Bible, you know, it stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. Well, that's true. (laughs) It is basic instructions. But the Bible is not an instruction manual. The Bible is to get to know Jesus Christ. This is why we have so many different divisions in the church and denominations. I'm not putting anybody down, but I'm just saying we have all kinds of opinions and doctrines of this and doctrines of that. We ought to have just one doctrine. If we were tuned in to the Spirit of God, all of us, we would have one doctrine. Amen. If you were tuned into the Spirit of God, we would just know. We wouldn't call a child a choice in America if we were all tuned into the Spirit of God because you would know that you know that every person is created in the image of God. Amen. You know, we have the keyboard here. Back in the day, I remember when Clayton was practicing for school, we had like a piano. Anybody know what that is? Anybody seen a, like a real piano, you know, it does. And you had to tune it, right? So you had professional people who would come out and tune that piano. But once you tune the piano and you had it perfect, you didn't get all the other pianos and bring it to this piano and tune it to the one you tuned, Right? You went back to the main source of the perfect tune and you tuned each piano to that same tuner. I don't even know if it was called a tuner. I'm sure butchering this, I bet. You can clean me up later. (laughs) But we have to be tuned. Once we're tuned in and we're dialed into the Spirit of God, you know what? We're all going to be on the same page. And that's when the church becomes powerful. So revelation is what advances the kingdom of God. What we need is a word from God. When you read the scripture, what you need to be looking for is God to speak to you. The words on the page do nothing for you. I know that sounds, I kind of have a tendency to step off into stuff. I know that's stepping off into something. But I'm telling you, the words on the page have to be inspired. I'll give you an example from Jesus. When he announced his ministry, he walked into the temple. He read from Isaiah, and he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. And he goes on and he reads the scripture. And he says, and preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he stops, he closes the book and sits down. But the very next phrase says, and the year of vengeance of our God. Jesus stopped right there. Why? Is it in the Bible? Yes. Is it true? Yes. But it wasn't for the time. He was speaking the word that God was inspiring and bringing to life at that time. Amen. Y'all with me today? I'm preaching better better than y'all are shouting today, but that's all right. The first revelation we have to have And it's basic. You know, so many things are basic. You know, whenever anybody, our politicians or anybody, tries to make everything so complicated, they just don't like what the simple answer is. Amen? They try to make it all complicated. It's really not that complicated. The first revelation that we have to have is what Jesus really did for us on the cross what that really means, and what the impact really is of that in our life. While we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. He who did not spare his son, his only son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not now, through him, freely give us all things? How many people really believe that? Do we really believe that? We got to refresh this. You know, I talk about 
flying all the time, and I know y'all probably get tired of that too. Good thing I don't preach too much because y'all don't get to hear it. But there's two types of flying. There's visual, where you're looking out the window and you're seeing what's going on. And then there's instrument flying. Instrument is where everybody kills themselves because you can't see. And we don't realize it because we have eyesight, but when you suddenly lose all visual references, your mind starts playing all kinds of tricks on you. In fact, the FAA has, has shown through research that the average, average pilot, listen to me closely, that flies into instrument conditions inadvertently, unexpectedly, not expecting it, the sky is clear, all of a sudden loses visual references, will lose control of the airplane within 90 seconds. You remember JFK, he killed himself in the airplane? He was in what's called a death spiral. He got over the water. He was not instrument rated, but he was flying at night. The sky was clear. He was legal. But the problem was he was over the water, and it was a dark night where there was no moon. So he had no horizon. He couldn't have no frame of reference. So he thought he was going straight and level. But you know what? He was turning. And as he was turning, what happens in a plane when you turn, you, it puts more load on the wings. And so he started descending. So he's in a turn doing this, just like this, doesn't even know it. Happens all the time because unexpectedly flying into instrument, losing visual references. So think about it in our walk with God. I remember when I was working on my instrument rating, my instructor used to tell me all the time, he said, you're going to be surprised. He said, you're going to work so hard to get this rating. And he said, you're going to be surprised how hard it is to stay current. Because you have, to, you have to do a certain number of instrument approaches and things to stay current, to keep your, your, your rating. Well, why is that? Well, most of the time, the weather's okay. Most of the time, you can avoid the clouds. So you end up not doing it. And those are the pilots that end up getting in trouble because they're not current. So we walk by sight so much, don't we? We walk by sight. We don't really walk by faith. We say we do, but we really don't because we live in America. We have health care. We have money, right? We can get a job. We can make money. We have what we need. We have the stuff. We can go to the store. We can do all these kind of things. We don't really have to walk by faith a whole lot. But unless you maintain your currency in the spirit, when you're faced with a situation where all of a sudden you have to walk by faith, it's difficult. Because all of a sudden you can't see anymore. And you've got to be able to, to, to make that adjustment. But back to Jesus, this is the revelation that we have to have of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And the, the analogy God gives us, and I can't even go there because I've got a son, I've got a little boy. My mind can't even go there, but I'm going to tell you the story. Abraham, his only his son, Isaac, God spoke to him one day, said, Abraham, I want you to take Isaac, take him up to a place I'm going to show you, and I want you to offer him as a burnt sacrifice before me. Abraham got up early in the morning, the Bible says, and went straight out to do it. That little boy was probably about my son's age, and he's looking, and he says, okay, where we're going to sacrifice. Huh. Well, Daddy, I see the wood, and I see the fire, but where is the sacrifice? Where is the lamb we're going to sacrifice? And so Abraham's telling him, God's going to provide. God's going to provide. Now imagine that. Imagine that. Now, ultimately, God did not require that of Abraham, but God did that for us. He sacrificed, and he wants us to understand the price that was paid. You know, in religion, we, 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 we've gotten to where, you know, we have all the little statements and everything, and I'm not putting things down, okay? I don't want to be critical because I'm not trying to be critical. But, you know, we always say, well, well it's not about me. It's about Jesus. Oh, it's just all about him. Well, I got news for you. If you don't have the revelation yet that the cross was all about you, then you are, don't have the revelation because the cross was all about you. All about you. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes, we are healed. 
God, he did not withhold anything from us to save humanity and pull us back. We were broke. We were bankrupt. We had nothing. And he sacrificed everything so he could bring us back. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, you need to go home and read it. It's only 12 verses. He says in, in that place, he said, it, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. When you break that down and you look at the words, what it really said is it delighted. He delighted in crushing him. Why? To save us. To save us. To save you. Once you understand the sacrifice and the price that was paid for you, it changes everything. You can't look at things the same anymore. You can't look at the challenges and the things that you face in your life the same way anymore because you understand the sacrifice and what he did for us on the cross. You know, John 3.16 is the one that we always quote. And it says, God so loved the world, he, came, you know, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. But we forget the next verse in 17. It said, God didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So that's the first revelation that we have to have if we're going to walk with God. And I just want to echo some things. I want you to turn over to Jeremiah 18. I guess we ought to read a scripture. And I'm going to go ahead and turn to it too because I want to. Starting in verse 1, it says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house. There will I will cause you to hear my words. And then he went down to the potter's house, and here he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so that he made it into a new vessel again, as it seemed good to him. And Katie was talking about having regrets and things in, in your life, certain things. How many know God is not a touch-up artist? God doesn't try to patch things up. He doesn't try to fix anything. He makes all things new. Everything becomes new. We are a new creation in him. All those things, old things are passed away. You cannot let those those. Those that let, let the enemy condemn you about stuff in the past. Amen. That you, the, those, those things are behind you and you cannot allow because God makes all things new. I'm going to speak a little specifically to the ladies. You know, I live with seven ladies. And I always said, you know, when I, um, after I raise these girls, I'm going to, I'm going to write a book about girls. I'm going to know so much about girls. And here I am, 20-something years in. I don't know any more than when I started. <laughs> but I can tell you this. I know that ladies tend to blame yourself for certain things and get under condemnation about certain things. And I want to prophesy that off of you today. Just get it off of you today. Amen. There's a little plaque I got my wife, and she needs to probably look at it more than she does. But it says, when you're feeling overwhelmed or you're feeling condemnation or whatever you're feeling, straighten your crown and remember whose daughter you are. You are a daughter of the king. You are a daughter of the king. Amen. We can't live in that. We can't allow those things to weight us down. So as we walk through, through our life and through our walk with him, it's a couple of things. There's different laws of spiritual warfare, but I want to share two of them with you, okay? There's a, lot of, there's a lot of laws of spiritual warfare, but I want to share two with you that are universal. Almost going to happen every time. Have you ever had to persevere for something? Pray for something, persevere. Maybe you're persevering right now. You're praying for something, praying for a loved one. Maybe you're facing something 
in your, in your physical body or somebody else's, and you're having to really pray and believe God. Well, there's a couple of laws that are almost always going to happen, unless it's just like an instantaneous miracle. The first is when you begin to speak your faith, the fire usually gets a whole lot hotter. Amen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were called before the king because they wouldn't bow to his idol, they spoke to the king and they were trying to talk him into bowing. And they said, well, God, who we serve, is able to deliver us and he will deliver us. But king, and I'm paraphrasing, you don't understand. King, it doesn't really matter if he does or doesn't because one thing's not gonna happen, we're not gonna bow. And the king says in the King James that he became wroth. Today, we would say he lost his mind. And he said, make that fire. He told them to make, they made the fire so hot to kill the guys that put them in the fire. That's how hot that fire was. Sometimes when you're persevering for things, the fire is going to get a whole lot hotter. Amen. Just expect it. Just like flying into the interim conditions, if you're expecting it, it's a whole lot easier. Amen? It's going to get hotter. It's probably going to get a whole lot hotter before you see the answer to it. Amen? That's one of the, that's one of the rules or one of the laws of spiritual warfare. That one's for free. No charge for that. The second one is some giants you've got to kill twice. Goliath, David slew Goliath. And you go back and read it. It says he threw the rock, killed him. It says the giant fell dead. That's what it says. He fell dead. Then it says he got the sword and went up and cut his head off and killed him with the sword. Many times when you're facing something, you will see, you will see an answer that all of a sudden the enemy will try to bring that back up again to discourage you. That's what happened, and we can't be like Elijah. Remember, Elijah had this enormous victory, called down fire from heaven, mocked the, sir, mocked the prophets of Baal, made them look like complete idiots, won the battle, and Jezebel said, I'm coming to get you. He thought he had already killed the giant. He thought the giant was dead. She rose up and said, no, I'm going to kill you, and he ran and hid in the cave. Some giants you got to kill twice. So when you, when you're, whatever it is you're facing, what if it's a diagnosis in your body and you feel like God has healed you, then all of a sudden you feel it coming back, pull that sword out, whack that head off. Some giants, you got to kill them twice. Don't let it discourage you. Amen. You've got to stick with what you believe. When, they, when you're flying, in, in, you, you've got to rely on your instruments when you can't see anymore. Because it's not relying on those instruments, it's what kills you. Because your mind starts playing tricks on you. And mind will convince you. Amen. But what do we need? We need the Word of God. The Word of God brings light. The entrance of thy Word bringeth light. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If you're in a dark room and you can't see, you can't move with confidence when you can't see, amen? But you turn the light on, all of a sudden you can see. Pickle, my baby, she's really into, into Barbies and you know, my kids are growing up and it's killing me, it's killing me. I just don't wanna see them grow up. So she's got her Barbies and she's got a Barbie set that would make, make anybody proud. I mean, she's got every Barbie you could mermaid. I didn't know there was so many Barbies. I mean, it's mermaid Barbies and this Barbie and airplane Barbies and all kinds of stuff. And so she pulls all that stuff out at night and it'll be all over the floor. And I'm always scared. I'm like, look, you got to pick this up. Because <laughs> if I have to come up here in the middle of the night, I can't see. But the word of God brings the light. And once we have the light, then we can see. Then we can see clearly. And those things don't play tricks on us. Because this is what happens when we get into a spiritual battle. Our mind starts telling us God doesn't care. Come on. Come on now. That's the earliest, that's the oldest trick in the book. That was his original trick. That's what he told Eve. God doesn't care about you. God doesn't want you to have this. God's trying to withhold something from you, trying to impugn the character of God. So when your circumstances and things start happening, that's what you'll start thinking, right? Your mind will start screaming at you. Disaster is coming. 
unless you look at your instruments, unless you're looking at the word of God and say, no, 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 this is not what the Bible says. Amen. This is the way we advance in the kingdom of God. I want to read one more thing, and then we're going to close. And this parallel, you know, there's a lot of scriptures that I, that I love. But this one, this one I love one, one of the, the most. If I can find it, I think I printed it out. Somewhere. Maybe it's in my other stack. But how many know the Spirit of God is transformative? How many know our walk with God is supposed to be transformative? How many know when Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice and when he yielded up his spirit, which he did yield up his spirit because he said, no man takes my life, right? The Bible says the veil of the temple was torn in half, ripped in half. So there were two key events that happened on the cross, to me anyway. The first was when he was on the cross and he looked and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And many times we think, oh, well, he's just had compassion on the people who crucified him, but that's not really true, I believe. Because I know he didn't just die for them, did he? He denied, died for everybody. And in Isaiah 53, it says, when, when you make his soul, y'all need to go home and read Isaiah 53. When you make his soul a sacrifice for sin, he will see his seed. At that point, when Jesus was offering up his spirit, he saw you he saw me. He saw the end of the beginning. He saw every sin we would ever commit. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. At that point, that's when we were forgiven. And then the veil of the temple, the second key event, the veil of the temple was ripped in half to the Holy of Holies, the place they could only go once a year. And guess what? If the priest wasn't right, he didn't come out alive. How many know that? They tied a rope onto his leg when he went in once a year to make atonement for the sins of the people. And they had little bells on his robe. And when they quit hearing the jingling, they yanked him out. Because if he went in and he wasn't clean, he could not survive in the presence of God. God could not look on sin. And this is what crushed Jesus because God turned his back on Jesus on the cross. He turned, he could not look on sin, he turned his back on him. That was the sacrifice that was made. Amen? We need to understand and have that in our hearts. One more scripture. Did I say that already? Well, it's actually two more scriptures, so I kind of lied. But it's a little bitty lie, right? <laughs> my, my third daughter, Bennett, <laughs> She used to, uh, she would, you know, she would, you know, she was a little bitty, but she would, she would lie like that. And she would say, <clears throat> I say, Bennett, did you brush your teeth? She would say, I did brush my teeth. Then she would say, but I really didn't. <laughs> so it's okay if you correct it quickly, I guess, was her philosophy, you know, so it's not really a lie. Genesis 41. And we're going to close with this. Oh, excuse me. Psalms 105. Psalms 105. You can, if you already turned to Genesis 41, you can, because we're going to go there too. Psalm 105, verse 17, he says, He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. How many know the story of Joseph? The word of the Lord. And notice this. It doesn't say God tested him. It said the word of the Lord tested him. Now, we got we to redefine what we think about test. You know, when I was growing up, I hated school. 
I felt like I was in a prison in school. I hated it. I despised it. Now, when I got out and went back to college and I got my PhD, I kind of liked it a little bit better, but I just hated school. You know, and some teachers have this idea of teaching is you, put a, you just put the hurdles in front of everybody and, you know, make them jump them. And if they jump them, well, then they learn. If they didn't, they didn't learn. So we think of a test as pass-fail. You don't fail a test in God because that's not what this word means, test. This word really means refinement. It really means to purify. The Bible says he's, he's like refiner's fire and fuller, fuller soap. He will thoroughly purge his threshing floor. This is the testing of God is taking all the bad stuff out and leaving all the good stuff in. Amen. This is why our the spirit is why it's so important when that veil was, was rent, we became indwelt by the Spirit of God. If you're indwelt by the Spirit of God, you cannot stay the same. You've got to change. But how do you change? You change through the renovate, renewing of your mind, which the word really means renovation. You got to get your mind out of the way and let the spirit have influence over you. Amen. Last scripture, Psalm, uh, excuse me, Genesis 41. I love this. It's one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. You got to think about what Joseph went through. He was betrayed. Think of all the things he was thinking. Betrayed by his own brothers, thrown in the pit. Then he was in the prison. Then he got to the palace and he got thrown out again. Then he's in prison once before. Think of all the things that Joseph went through in his life. But this is a type and a shadow of what God does for us. It says, Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God has made me forget all the toil in all my father's house. God, it doesn't matter what we go through. God is going to bless you to the point where you're going to forget how bad it was. Amen. That's God's best for us. That's what God wants to do for us. That's what God wants to do for you. He wants to bless you to the point where all that stuff in the past is gone. You don't even remember it anymore because the blessing is so great. I shared that story in the beginning of what happened with us. Now I've got six children. God has just overwhelmed me. And five girls, five girls. Who can say that? Not many people can. <laughs> I said one more scripture, so I guess I lied again. I'm going to read you one more, and then I promise you we're going to close. And if anybody want, needs prayer or wants prayer, I'm going to pray a little bit. Amen? Is that all right? Y'all still love me? Sure, didn't sound too convincing. <clears throat> and I'm gonna read this out of the Kenneth Weiss translation, Hebrews chapter one. Katie was hitting on all these scriptures in Hebrews, but I wanna read this one. I wanna read it out of the Kenneth Weiss translation because I think it really articulates it really well. It says, in many parts and in different ways, God in former times having spoken to the fathers by means of the prophets in these last days has spoken to us in one, by nature, his son, who he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he constituted the ages, who being the outraying of his glory, and I love this part, the exact reproduction of his essence, sustaining and guiding and propelling all things by the word of his power, having made purification of sins, sat down by the right hand of the majesty on high. God is speaking to us through his son. Who is his son? His son is his word. The word of God is what we have to have. The word of God is what contains everything. The word of God is what communicates everything to us. The word of God, the Bible is so we can know God. You know, my wife and I have been married so long, we, we complete each other's sentences. We know what each other's thinking. We don't have to talk about it. We already know because we know each other. God wants us to know him like that. That's the walk that we have to have with God or we will end up at some point potentially straying away from God. He wants that relationship.
You know, people say, well, you know, everybody's going to die at some point. You know, I'm believing I'm not going to die. I want to be like Enoch. You know, Enoch, it says, but he walked with God, and then, and then he walked with God so closely that one day he just wasn't there anymore. One day he walked with God so close, and God said, well, golly, Enoch, we're closer to my house than we are yours. Why don't you just come home with me today? Amen. That's the kind of relationship he wants us to have with him, that knowing his word, getting a word from God, understanding, having that quickened word within our heart. Because you're supposed to do the work of the kingdom. You're supposed to walk in a way. I'm telling you, you walk with God and you're close with God. You're going to get more done for God by accident than most people get done on purpose. Because it's not, we're not called to witness. We are called to be a witness. God will work through you when you're focused on him. How many want God to work through you? You need God to work through you. And I'm telling you, there's people that need God to work through you for them. Amen. Let's just pray. Oh, we thank you.